Hello everyone, welcome back. Today I'm going to go through the sequence calculus. We've been building up to this in the last couple of videos. We've already seen what it means to build up a grammar and why it is that we have to choose different logics depending on our application. One logic might be good for data science applications, another for computation, another one is better for reasoning or the sciences. So how do we actually get that information to someone else or even a computer? And how can we be certain that the kind of logic we think is logical is actually what we think it is? To do that, we'll be using what's known as the sequent calculus. And it's part of a large family of different ways to write mathematics that measures the kind of logic that we're interested in. It is, however, one of the most popular notations. And although it's a little goofy at the start, it does exactly what we need out of these kinds of notations. So let's get started. Our logical require, logic requires a few things. First, our context. This is the place where we store all the basic assumptions that everyone should know already. This can include a lot of information, including all the books you were supposed to know, conventions that everyone's agreed to. Well, obviously, we can't really always remember all our context. But the key thing is that we tend to put into our context important things that we don't necessarily expect everyone to remember. So it's a good place to put your logic rules down. We also needed a grammar. This was a way of putting the sentences together in a way that everyone could read them the same way. We saw the value of what are called rooted trees to establish what something means and get it right at the same time. It's not as flexible as human natural grammar, but it's a good grammar for communicating mathematics. And now we're into the rules that we need. So let's get started with that. Our first approach to this might be to just look at history. Aristotle was an enormously successful um, theoretician, logician, uh, thinker of his time, philosopher. It's really back in an era before we really had great labels for whatever it was that him and Plato and others like the sophists were doing. But one thing that's been handed down from this era is the syllogisms. And it's really a poetic style of writing, very similar to how various things of poetry have been handed down through performances and art from the same era. And it's not the only way of logical thinking, but it became dominant for a long period of time and was broken down into three parts. Here I'm going to read one of these syllogisms, and then I'll describe its minor parts and major parts. All men are mortal. Socrates is a man. Therefore, Socrates is mortal. The key idea here is that we're going to pass some information along in categories. For example, we see the green men is later going to be substituted for one man. So it's a classification of sorts. And Socrates is repeated in two sentences, and mortal is also repeated. The other things that are doing work here are words like all and is. We can see that those play a role in that all men is going to therefore capture Socrates as one man. And this is the kind of logic that we use in our everyday speech. In the time, it was broken down into two parts, the major premise and the minor premise. The major premise being the thing we we're going to make a final conclusion about, and the minor premise, how we're going to modify the major conclusion. And we get to the final answer. Now, this worked for quite a while and was explored extensively. It turns out that there's a whole bunch of these styles. They're also called sy syntax logic. And in this model, these syllogisms, there's 256 ways that we could combine all the words and colors. But only 24 turned out to be what were called valid, meaning they sounded like reasonably good, solid arguments. And this is a hint at what's really going on here. When we create a logic, we are deciding for ourselves to create a language in which we can write sentences, and then we select from them a few that we consider to be valid ways of communicating some truth to each other. And that can certainly change from one application to the next. So let's get started on the more modern view of all these projects. So at the time of the 18, 1900s, many forms of logic were emerging. But Frege is one of the main people to have created the toolbox we needed to talk about logic resourcefully. And he did it through isolating the premises from the conclusion. Jensen would then create the notation that we have today. The key deal tells we now say with words like entails, but you might also hear proves or implies. There's a lot of fuzzy words that we use in common interchange in English that don't quite meet the standards of the logical formalism. So I'll try to stick with entails at least while we're learning it. But you'll catch me on occasions using other words. The key idea is not the symbol so much as where we place it. Here, I place the premise at the top, and I can place the conclusion below it. The idea is that the premise precedes the conclusion, and the separator makes it clear that there is a premise versus a conclusion. 
And because all we need to do is separate, we can put the premises between any kind of symbol. And this is one of the main differences in different people's writings of logic, is simply they prefer a different symbol than this one here. This entail symbol is what's known as the turnstile. And it comes from, historically, two words. One was the judgment. The vertical line was what Frege used to say, I want to judge this sentence right now. And then the horizontal line was to say, I want to judge its content. There's a very subtle point going on here. You could say, I want to judge the actual words, but you might mean, actually, these words mean something, and I want you to judge what they mean. That subtle change became less and less important as we moved into further forms of logic, and today they've been fused together as the single turnstile. It reads roughly to judge the content. Now, you might have trouble finding this symbol on a computer. It's not one of the standard keyboards. Before you go figuring out how to rotate the letter T, you should know that there are some Unicode codes, there are some HTML commands, and if you know LaTeX, you can use slash V dash. It stands for vertical dash, which is roughly what the symbol is made from. Hopefully you can find some appropriate solution for your situation. Next up, I want to actually build an example of one of these typological operators, what we'll call a logical operator going forward. And the key idea about logical operators is that we need to communicate them in a grammar using the sequent calculus, separate the premises from the conclusions. But to do that, we really need to think about what the rules are. But let's get started with a possible language. We want to talk about the words and. We can think of that in everyday speech as a good place to start. So we would think that we could say both green and blue. Now, I'm not assigning a value to green and blue, but simply giving us that there are two values. Okay, both here communicates that two things will come, but we probably don't need the word both. That's more for human natural language. We could get by with less, but if we needed it, we could say both Jack and Jill, but we could drop it completely. And we could even change this to more syntactic notation with just like an ampersand symbol. This is very common in computer science to see something like the letter and as the ampersand or maybe two of them combined. You could also replace this into a programming language like this, we could say i is less than or equal to j, and and, which just reads as and, j is less than or equal to 100. It would be a standard line of text. In mathematics, we use this notation with the upside down v. It's called conjunction sometimes. So you'll also see the word conj or conjunction associated with the letter and. And here I'm being careful to include parentheses so that as I grow to more and more ands, I can keep track of the order in which I glued them together. Here's an example of using the conjunction symbol. I can say x squared equals zero, the quantity, and x is greater than or equal to zero. Resist the need to figure out if something is true right now. Right now we're simply saying, what is the syntax of writing these symbols together? So we've established a language in which we can write the symbol and. And just for this illustration, I'm gonna stick with this single upside down wedge as the notation for and going forward. But feel free to substitute a computer science notation or even use a both and kind of notation as you're learning this. So the first rule we need is to make an introduction. And since this is our first introduction, let me introduce you to it. An introduction is a rule. It's a rule in logic to say when the symbol can be used. It's in a sense introducing this symbol to where it wasn't before. So what we typically do is we have a set of premises that if those premises are met, then we get to introduce the symbol. In this situation, the premise is somewhat straightforward. We're trying to talk about and, so we need two terms, P, Q. It's hard to even read this without using the word and as natural language, but we would separate them by a comma simply to say, we're not assuming a logical construct here. We simply have these things all at once. So P, Q occur at the same time as a premise. When that occurs, then we have the right to say P and Q. Notice that the and is being introduced as a conclusion. It is entailed by P comma Q. This I here is simply the word introduction. I'm trying to remind myself how to think about it. Now, let's take a closer look. Remember, nothing happens absent of something else. The abbreviation above is assuming implicitly that there's a context. And to make it clear, I'm going to denote the context by gamma. It's because it's used a lot by mathematics that we see this gamma, but you might be just as happy to use letters like CTX reminding you of context. However you choose to remind it, the premises now always include the context. You have to assume the context is clear for everybody. So this always precedes any entailment. 
each context gives you some data. And this fleshes out a subtlety. If we return to the box in blue, you may wonder who on earth gave you P comma Q? Why would you know P comma Q if you didn't already have P and Q? And the premises do not explain where P and Q come from. The reality is that they must have come from some context that you already had. So the context told me that P was true, and the context also told me that Q was true. Having both of them together allowed me to say the context told me that P and Q were true. So this is a more expressive way of describing what's in the blue box. Now, often we want to save space and mental energy on things that are somewhat obvious. So if context has made P and context has made Q and context has made P and Q, we can just dispense with the gammas in the front and simply write P comma Q entails P and Q. And that's what we'll do for the most part. Remember, the I is just here as a placeholder name for this equation. It's trying to tell us this is I for introduction. And we've snuck in the symbol of what's being introduced. This, in this case, is called the wedge. So we've got our language and the grammar. We've got our first rule, how to introduce an and symbol, the wedge. Now we need to get rid of that symbol, or what we might say is eliminate the symbol. To eliminate the symbol, that would mean that we'd start in our premises as having something with that symbol. So we know already that to the left of the turnstile, we'll see P and Q. To the right of the turnstile, we need to get some information out of it. So if I know P and Q, what do I know about anything else? P. So let's start there. If I have P and Q, then that entails me to know that I have P because I couldn't have both if I didn't have at least one of them. And if I have P and Q, I also entail knowing Q. These are called eliminations because we see in the conclusions there's no more symbol wedge. We have eliminated the and symbol. So we have now introduced it as a conclusion and eliminated it when it was a premise. These are the two things we need to remember. Again, there's all of this happening somewhere. So if we were being more precise, we would put in the context. The context would entail P and Q. That would explain where we knew that P and Q were true. And once we knew that P and Q were true in this context, we could then thin that down to just knowing P. And if we knew P and Q over here, we could thin that down to knowing Q. So notice a few things have happened. Not only have we sprinkled in the context to make it very precise where we got something from, we have also done so with two ways to get out. In a future discussion, we'll be talking about types, and then we'll give these names programming language words. For example, the introductions will be things like set, set this to true, set this to seven, and the eliminations will be functions that start with the word get, get P from P and Q, get Q from P and Q. So these are like putting data in, and these are like putting data out. The data in this case is just truth. Put truth in, take truth out. If you think of it as a function, it might help you connect with some of the programming things that we'll be doing later. But even if you just think of this as a relationship of truths and falsehoods, it would be a good enough way to understand it. If we put this all together, we have a nice acronym way to remember these things. Notice that our logical AND has a language to describe it, an introduction rule, and elimination. Going back to how we remember things, we can do LIE or LIE. This lie initial is just going to remind us that to introduce any logical symbols, we'll have to pick a language with its grammar, its introduction rules, and its eliminations. And this is a complete description of AND for our purposes. It's all written in the sequent calculus. The calculus component, the computing component, is that we put symbols on the left and we move them to the right using these various terms. So let's see how that works. Here I have and in use. But I'd like to ask, where am I using the L, I, or E? What part of these am I using? So here, let's read the sentences together. Measurements are absolute values. I'm going to turn that into symbols by saying the context is telling me that L is greater than or equal to zero. I'll call that conclusion P. That's the sentence, measurements are absolute values. Absolute values are things that are greater than zero. So it's a symbol version on the right and a word version on the left. Now let's look at the next one. Area is 100. If area of our length is squared, then L squared equals 100. 
That would be the next piece of this. We could call this Q if we like, and we would say the context entails this equation, some statement of truth. Now, if I put these together, then I would be able to say that L is greater than or equal to zero and L squared equals 100. Notice without these, I wouldn't have the same information. If L squared equals 100, L could be minus 10. Putting them together is narrowing down what can actually be represented as L. Now, forgetting about the details about what this stuff is talking about, areas and squares and square roots, let's look at which of these L, I, or E we just applied to get to the conclusion. Well, the premises are above the line. So these are two separate facts combined into one single conjunction, an AND. So to me, that reads as this one here. I have a P and a Q, and they entailed the AND symbol. I've used the introduction rule. That's simple. The key thing is to identify whether I'm using L, I, or E, and apply it correctly. L is usually used at the very beginning to throw out sentences that don't make any sense at all. If you improperly use the symbols, it won't pass the language step. This is where we parse our grammar and see if we get the right meaning of the words. And if not, we don't even bother to pass any judgments to any rules. So keep that in mind as your first step. Check that you don't have improper language before you try to introduce or eliminate. Let's see another example. What part of the lie uh, acronym are we using when we say lakes are deep and wide, therefore lakes are deep? Well, we see it in words here instead of symbols. The word and is playing the role of a P and Q. And what we've done is gotten rid of the and. And we've also kept just part of it. Lakes are deep. So this is a P and Q producing one of the terms. In this case, the first one, we'll call it P. So we're saying that P and Q entails P. We're using one of our elimination rules. In this case, the one on the left. The elimination rule on the right would have given us wide. Lakes are wide. So here's our summary. Sequent calculus succeeds by separating the premises from the conclusions. We use either a horizontal line or sometimes a vertical line or sometimes a T-style, turnstile. Whatever the separators are, those we read as entailment or some equivalent English language word. Once we have these, we want to introduce our logical operators, and we break that process down in three steps. We'll need the language and grammar to write that. Usually that means the symbols, and whether you put the symbols before and after with a symbol in between, one in front, do you put it in the exponent, whatever notation you're using, you describe that in your grammar. That's the language part of your lie. Then comes the introduction rule. The introduction rule tells you how to produce that symbol based on a set of premises. And the premises might be layered with other premise conclusion pairs, other sequence in the sequent calculus. And finally, we have the elimination rules. What? When we have in the premises, if we have some of the terms, how do we get rid of the symbol that we've just introduced? Putting these together will give you a very powerful toolbox, and it's the first elementary calculus that we've seen. Thanks for your time.